Statement of Neil Stephen, regarding a strange experience with an arcade cabinet on Christmas Eve, 2016. Original statement given May 28, 2017. Committed to tape March 9, 2019. Audio recording by Adam Strong, archival assistant of the Magnus Institute, St. John's. Statement begins. I'm honestly shocked I got my mom to bring me down here. After all the questioning and reporters bothering us, when I asked her to give me a ride downtown, she was wary of letting me leave the house. It wasn't even my idea, actually. My older brother had heard about you through a friend of his, and suggested I come give my statement. Anyways, because Mom is waiting outside, I can't really make this long. Follow up if you need to. Just, I need you to know I'm not just some skeet having a laugh. I need you to believe me. Lord knows nobody other than a few of my friends will. It was the weeks leading up to Christmas, and my friend group and I were having fun as we usually did. We spent about half of our time indoors, playing on Discord, trying to see who could get the better score in whatever game was popular at the time. The other half of our time was spent at the mall, scouring EB games, or trying to get the high score at the Starcade on whatever machine isn't broken whenever we're in. <laughs> We don't usually care much for games like Overwatch or The Witness or whatever, but we scoured for any game that took a sig very significant challenge to beat, or had strategies being developed to be beaten as fast as possible. Games like Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, and Doom. Occasionally, Freddy Wilkinson would also drag us out to some abandoned building, and we'd explore it whenever we really could. Night, day, whenever the place seemed the most deserted. That's not to say that the rest of us don't enjoy going out to those spots, it's just that Freddy seems to enjoy it a little bit more than us. School was pretty tame for the first half of December. I know the teachers like to ramp up schoolwork in the second half to make sure that we get things done by Christmas break, so any time before that was basically a holiday. At least for us. I know Aaron Collins had a bit of a nervous breakdown around the 10th, but we didn't really pay her any attention. She wasn't really in our group of friends. One day, I'd say it's around the 15th, we're hanging out at the mall after class, and the clerk at EB Games mentions there's, that there's a new game at the Starcade. That makes all of our ears perk up. A new game? How had we not known? I suppose it had been a while since we'd been to the mall. Nonetheless, we left immediately, without buying anything desperate to see this new machine. <sighs> Something you have to know about the Starcade is that it's old. It's run down, and basically nobody goes there, and they never get anything new in. They just don't make enough money to. That's just a fact of them all. But as we turned the corner into the cinema where the Starcade is, we saw it immediately. Even the sea of teenagers lined up to play couldn't hide it glowing vibrantly against the muted colors of the rest of the arcade. It was a slick blue casing with black lines like motherboard wires running up the side. In bright, alluring letters along the top, it spelled Kahirath. An interesting name for a game, sure, but we've seen interesting names for games in the past. Really, the only strange choice is that the devs didn't name it something a little more pronounceable. You know, to help with word of mouth. I guess it didn't really need it, though. We didn't care much. We were much too enraptured with the prospect of having another game to master. I remember being shocked at how many people were lined up, remembering that a lot of people didn't want to spend too much money this close to Christmas. We pushed our way through the seemingly endless sea of people around our age, some of it younger, a few much older, up to the prize desk. Funny... As we pass by the machine, it seems that's where the lineup stopped, leaving a vast ghost town in the rest of the Starcade. Not much different than any other day, sure, but given the crowd of people outside, you'd think there should have been at least a few stragglers inside, but no. Nick Mills was at the prize desk when I walked up. I asked him where the machine had come from, and he simply shrugged and gestured to the back room. He said it had showed up about a week ago in the workshop out back. No signage as to who owned it, no note, no nothing. It happened occasionally when someone in the city wanted their 
arcade machines fixed up and called ahead, or when someone dropped off an anonymous donation. The strangest thing about it, though, was that they couldn't take the arcade's tokens. Only quarters. I asked if that seemed pretty old school, and Nick shrugged softly again. It was at that point that I realized that my friends hadn't followed me to the prize desk. I turned around, and they were practically nowhere to be seen. I glanced around to each of our favorite machines, pinball, Mortal Kombat, nothing. Then, a fight broke out. Turns out, Freddy got into a bit of a scrap when someone left the machine and he tried to cut in line. Obviously, the kid who had waited for hours was pretty intent on playing, but was it, what was interesting was the amount of force she used to try and get Freddy away. I won't go into too many details, but Freddy walked away with a shining black eye and a finger broken back so far he could touch the back of his hand. There was blood on the floor, all of which I know to be Freddy's because the little girl came out of the scrap spotless. No cuts, no bruises, nothing. Now, I know Freddy Wilkinson. He can handle himself in a fight. The fact that the little girl beat him so easily and with so much unnecessary force... I told the guys we should go home and maybe get Freddy checked out. Freddy declined the hospital, but we decided to go home anyway. It's interesting, and a little bit embarrassing, honestly. I, my mom says I play too many f video games, that they'll rot my brain out. But the allure that I felt to this game was different. It was almost physical. I don't really want to admit it, but I did not want to leave that arcade. When we got to school on Monday, things seemed, well, I have to admit it, normal. Plenty of people couldn't shut up about that game, though. People were saying that it hadn't been beaten yet, and that people were bringing hundreds of dollars in quarters just to be the first one to be able to beat it and claim glory. Things were pretty busy on the students' end of things, and teachers seemed to be rushing us as well. I think I had a history paper the next week, a math test that Wednesday. It was a bit of a rush. That week was relatively quiet among my friend group, though, other than the occasional banter on Discord over who had the most recent world record in what game. It was Thursday when I got the private message from Freddy. He was asking when we could go to the Starcade again. I mentioned I was free the next day, and that was it. I didn't think anything of it. When we got to the Starcade again, the sea of teams was equally as big this time as it was last time, even though it had been a week. This time, though, this time it seemed more organized, more linear. Like people were lining up calmly to play this legendary arcade cabinet. For some reason, uh, it almost made me feel sick. That passed, uh, especially as I noticed the shining machine at the front of the line. It almost got it brighter, shining proudly like a soldier going to war. I noticed Fred had brought his quarters, but he also brought a $20 bill. I was wondering what it was for until he started slinking up to Nick at the prize desk. He bribed him to allow us to stay during closing and play the machine. I mean, Nick knew us well enough. He trusted us. But he definitely told us that if anything went wrong, we were going to be in trouble for sure. And it, wouldn't, it wasn't the first time that we'd done it. We waited until closing. Me and Freddy bought some tokens and hung out as we normally would have. We took the Mortal Kombat machine, uh, close to Kihidith. You don't have much time to look anywhere else while playing Mortal Kombat, but whenever we were between rounds, I would sit and watch people coming away from the icy blue cabinet. Some came away... different. I don't know exactly how to word it, but... As I watched them walk back through the neat, tidy lines of people, they were more... messy, almost. The look in their eyes was one of a shaken soul. But I watched the screen, nothing was different for anyone. Sure, some people got further than others, but that's just how a hard game works. Some people are good at it. I guess I chalked it up to their frustration at the time. I guess that's why, when the Starcade closed for the night, I had no qualms about Freddy playing. He put in a quarter, played around, didn't win, and then put in another quarter again, taking it over and over from the stack of quarters he set on the machine. Standard practice. 
He played again and again and again until I was sure he was getting a carpal tunnel from pressing those buttons. Occasionally he'd offer for me to play, and I'd politely decline, making up some excuse about I didn't want to take his quarters. I just couldn't shake that alluring feeling I had the week before. I didn't want to touch that machine with a ten-foot pole. So, I waited for him to finish. Later I told him it was getting kind of late and that I wanted to be home to hop on Discord, but I don't even think he heard me. Freddy barely budged. I got my bag from by the Mortal Kombat machine and brought his over too, but he just seemed to have this mentality of just one more game, you know? So what do you really do in that situation? I guess my hand just reached out and I took his stack of quarters. Well, he lashed out at me. He threw a really solid swing at me, narrowly missing, clawing my throat, and grasped desperately at the quarters in my hand. I was yelling and backing up trying to, to try and get away from him, but he still had a bit more reach than I thought he did. Quarters went everywhere, crashing all over the arcade machines and sprawling out over the floor. It really wasn't like him to lash out like that, and I told him so. Once I didn't have his quarters, whatever possessed him seemed to leave him. Nick heard all this, of course, and promptly kicked us out. Figures. I went the rest of the weekend without hearing from Freddy. At school on Monday, things were quieter than they should have been. Turns out, a few students had had nervous breakdowns over the weekend. Ones that you wouldn't have really expected to. You know, like, one of the preps, Spencer Bell, never gave a care to much in his life. The girl everyone was sure was going to be class president Molly, we Molly Reed, sorry. Even weed-smoking arts kid Edith Holland. None of them were at the school the following Monday. Neither was Freddy. It was then that I knew we had to destroy it. I don't know how I knew. It was just some instinctive feeling, like a seed growing deep inside of me. I noticed it first when we were leaving the arcade the first time, but... At that point, I just couldn't ignore it. That, added with my guilt of letting Freddy play for so long and not telling him my concerns, perhaps I felt a bit responsible about the whole situation. It had all plagued on my mind for so long, there was nothing I could do to stop myself from rallying this friend group and going to the Starcade that fateful evening. It started with a quick message to the group chat and that I needed help breaking in somewhere. This was pretty normal. Freddy did it all the time. But this time, I packed my backpack with spray paint and a crowbar. I needed to make sure this... thing was dead. Of course, I didn't tell my friends what I was doing. They, they would have stopped me. Through the entire car ride there, I was a strange mix of cowering anxiety and electric excitement. There was something about knowing I'd be destroying something in a facility that was still running. We'd have to be careful of the security guards and have to watch out for the cameras. So, when we stopped the car at the mall, they thought there had to have been some kind of mistake. There wasn't, I told them, and they started to protest. All of them saying things along the lines of the fact that we go there all the time, that it's really illegal. All I did was turn back to them, and they stopped. I guess the look in my eyes was enough for them to trust me. The feeling of dread walking up to the arcade window was unlike anything I had ever felt. It grew in my chest, like my heart was going twice the speed it was in the car. The adrenaline was pumping through me. I felt like I could run a marathon. I had entered the Starcade so many times before, but this time... This time I was carrying a bag of spray paint and a crowbar. It carried a bit of weight to it. Metaphorically and physically, I mean. It wasn't hard to break the window. The oppressive silence of the arcade inside was a stark difference to anything I'd heard there before. It was like being in school after hours, a place where you're used to seeing hundreds of people suddenly deserted. It was sad, really. A place so full of life and color, so suddenly barren. After a short pause, I climbed in through the broken window, taking care not to cut myself. My friends were a little bit more hesitant, but I think they were more worried about me than anything. I guess they just didn't want to see me get hurt the same way Freddy did. Hell, we didn't even know how Freddy got hurt. He just didn't show up to school and didn't answer any of our tasks. Something bad had to have happened. 
but they followed me in. I crept carefully up to the cabinet. I remember thinking that it had to be powerless in the state that it was in. You know, turned off. But my heart was beating thunderously in my ears, and as I set my bag down with a clunk next to the electric blue side panel, I didn't even think about where my friends were. I'm guessing that they just sat on the side and watched. Unzipping my book bag was the longest moment of my life, as I pulled out my red spray paint. Shaking it rang out through the mall, but at that point I just had to get it done. I let loose the crimson paint on the side, finally, finally creating an imperfection, a blemish on the pristine game. I covered the title with a bit too much paint, and it dripped down onto the black void of the screen. It was at that point I got the crowbar out. Holding the cold steel in my hands was weird, almost wrong, not in the arcade. A part of my brain tried desperately to stop me from smashing in the screen, prying open the back, destroying the thing. Maybe that's because part of me was protecting me from what I was going to find. I pried open the coin collection, taking a few quarters for the road. I smashed the screen in. I did anything I could think of to rid the arcade of that... that demon. I started kicking it with all my might. I was so lost in the act that I didn't even hear my friends call out to me until I was tipping the machine over. I don't even know how I did that. It would barely budge on any other day. I finally saw what my friends were calling to me about. The floor, my sneakers. It was all covered in blood. It was oozing, dripping out of the machine. I grabbed my bag as fast as I could and left. The next day, the arcade was closed for maintenance. I wanted to tell Nick that I was sorry, that I just wanted to fix things, but he wasn't in at work. Even if he had been, I, I wouldn't have been able to get anywhere near the arcade to talk to him. None of us saw Freddy again. Not online, not at school after break, nothing. I guess I'm just glad I stopped. The... The machine before I could do anything to anyone else. Statement ends. Uh, honestly, I'm not really sure what to say to this. Given the very few full names in this statement, Grant found it pretty hard to follow up with anyone about whether or not the machine was... bleeding. Unfortunately, the police also weren't too keen on confirming whether or not the incident occurred, and Mr. Stephen didn't wish to provide any more details to what he supposedly saw that night. We did follow up with Nicholas Mills, however. He corroborates the fact that a game called Kihirath was present for about a week in the Starcade after being found in the workshop, but notes that he had put in his two weeks notice, about two weeks before the incident, so that he could have Christmas off. We reached out to the Starcade, but they refused to comment. It does appear that Aaron Collins, Spencer Bell, Molly Reed, Edith Holland, and Freddie Wilkinson all disappeared within the month of December 2016. These we did get police reports on, and it appears no bodies have turned up since the missing person cases were opened. I'm tempted to chalk this one up to hallucination and trauma of losing such a close friend. Nobody can corroborate the important parts of Mr. Stevens' story, it just seems to be a tragic tale of a young boy losing his friend far too early. Recording ends.